speciality is remote sensing. So I try, I work in trying to develop models that can assess or evaluate land surface processes through uh, satellite data. Um, as you must know, uh, the remote sensing data is acquired or is based on the on the interaction of light with matter. That means that. The, the information that we get or that we obtain from remote sensing data is based on the life or matter processes. Okay? And all these processes are the ones that happen at the land surface. All the processes that are happening in this area, for example, that we are here, with the tree, the soil, the, the litter, everything. So all these, these processes can be monitored from satellite based on, on the interaction that, uh, that the light has with, with the matter. Uh, based on that, it's possible with the images from satellite infer or assess what is happening on the land surface. How we do that? We do it combining or integrating data from satellite and data from the, from the field. One of the, the objectives of the Goodman Network is to acquire data in the field to be able to assess processes at the land surface and compare these processes with, uh, with the, the information we are getting from the, from the satellites. In terms of satellites, the mountainous areas where we are here, um, in terms of observation of, of mountainous areas, what I mean is there is some, some special characteristics. Mountainous areas are, have a, a really two characteristics that are very special for satellites. One is the presence of, of strong gradients. That is the variability for the variation, for example, of the vegetation from the low areas to the to the top of the mountain that occur in really short distances. And the other one is the, the shadows. It's very common, of course, if, if there is a mountain range that you have an, a, a, a face that is more sunny and the other one is, is shadow. And if you have a, a rough uh, rough relief, then you have shadow source. So these are two things that are very important when working with satellites, okay? Because what really would be optimal for mountainous areas would be satellites with uh, high spatial resolution. That means with small, with small pixels, so you can see the processes in more detail. The other part of the observation with satellites are the, 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 the um, temporal frequency means the, the data can be acquired, for example, on a daily basis, or on an hourly basis, or on a 15 days basis, in a, the, in a, I mean, in dif at different periods. But when you have observations acquired in an homogeneous manner of, from the same area, what you can see is what is happening, how it's changing, and then you really can study the dynamics as I said before, at different temporal scales. This is this is uh, especially useful for climate change studies, okay? Because because at the end we will really be able to study climate change deeply when we have long time series, okay? Because then you will see really the changes at the scale of, of, of climate change. Some of the applications or some of some of the processes that we study can be the fires in mountains. We can see how the fire season changes. We can found sometimes the fire season changes uh, with time. For example, depending on the, if the summer starts earlier or start later, you can have the fire season at the beginning of September or at, at mid-August. No? And you can calculate or you can assess that really quantitatively with time series from remote sensing. I like especially the use of remote sensing data for analyzing surface processes in time. For example, droughts. Okay, in the Mediterranean area we really have frequent droughts uh, in, in, in long term. Uh, maybe one year is very wet, but then the next year is, is dry. So we have, uh, also we have two characteristics. What? One, that is, we have drought every summer, so we are going to have to deal with this drought, but then we have, in longer periods, we have uh, multi-year droughts of, of, of several years then it's really difficult in this case to differentiate, to distinguish between what is the normal uh, drought in summer, because we have this dry period, and what is a really extremely or abnormal drought. If you want to evaluate that, you really need 
データインタイム One of the first application, applications of GUMNET data, not just from、uh, the station here at, at Herreria, but from every GUMNET station, has been the,、uh, the analysis of surface air temperature over the Sierra de Guadarrama and its surroundings. Now,、uh, in order to do that, observational data from the GUMNET stations and some other stations from the Spanish Meteorological Service has been compared. To a model, to a regional climate model. Observational data in this case is used to, to、um, evaluate the performance of the model. Now, the study was divided in two parts. For the first part, temperature and its variability、uh, were analyzed for the last 20 years. Results show that temperature distribution over the, over the area.、Um, Is closely related to, to orography, that is to the terrain. But this, there is something we all know that the highest parts of the mountains are colder than the lowlands around it. But there's something a bit peculiar in this case, which is that temperature decreases in a very linear way. Also, temperatures on the northern plateau seem to always be below those on the southern plateau.、Um, Now,、um, regarding the temperature variability,、um, results show that、um, this temperature, well, well, temperature variability is, so as to say, changes in temperature through time、uh, with respect to a mean value. So, results show that,、um, that the ranges of temperature variability. Uh, are wider with increasing height. Also,、um, we found it noteworthy that these changes in, in, in temperature are the, the behavior of temp temperature variability over the area is very homogeneous. That is, that, that temperature behaves in time for the last 20 years、uh, in the same way for. For all the area, you know, it doesn't matter if it is、uh, on any point uh, of, on, on any of the plateaus or on the top of the mountains. For the second part of, of the work,、uh, we focused our analysis on temperature trends over the last 20 years. And we saw that there has been a warming in the vast majority. Of, of the area more pronounced in autumn on the southern plateau, where、um, trends over one Celsius degree per decade can be found. Now, if we extend these, these, these、um, analyses to the last decades up to the second half of the 20th century, we saw that there's, there's been a warming in almost every site since about the 1950s. But although this, this,、uh, mm, this warming is uneven through time, it's more pronounced too in, in autumn. However, and that this is regarding to global change, in the case of the Sierra de Guadarrama, there is no clear evidence, no, no clear relation, sorry, no clear relation between、uh, warming and increasing altitude. And that would be all. This part of the meteorology、uh, deals mainly with the transfer processes from the surface to the lower layer、uh, close to the, to the ground. We are especially interested in the boundary layer or the atmospheric boundary layer, which is the part、uh, roughly around、uh, one kilometer where we have a, a contrasting along the day. A very specific、uh, cycle, daily cycle, of different temperature, wind, and other meteorological variables, and also the turbulent fluxes. So, we are able to have、um, 
the characteristic of the cooling and surface, the cooling during the night and the, and the heating during the, during the day, and the changes of the stability along the 24 hours uh, along the day. So one of the very interesting things that we uh, evaluate is as some other larger scale uh, phenomena like uh, mountain breezes, which are specifically uh, studied in this environment, uh, interaction with uh, turbulent processes. So why is this place interesting to study turbulent, uh, turbulence and also mountain breezes? Well, because we have a very uh, clear slope, local slope, which is the uh, Avantos mountain, and then we have a very clear direction, wind direction during the night, a very clear wind direction during the day. What is the origin of these uh, flows, which are called thermally driven flows? This is because the difference in temperature between the slope and the air in the surrounding makes differences in pressure and then generates winds. So during the night we have that cold winds come down slope from the northwest, while during the day we have the opposite direction coming from the southeast. So this is a very repetitive cycle and it is really very interesting how the different conditions, for example, at surface where we can measure the temperature and soil uh, moisture uh, influences the uh, wind speed. So, for example, when we have uh, a drier conditions, like in summer, we usually have larger uh, speeds, larger wind speeds. So this produces a different stability processes during the afternoon and evening transition to the uh, nocturnal stable boundary layer, creating different transfer processes. So. This is one of the main things that we study at this place. Uh, on one side, we study the change in the daily wind direction from night to day uh, with these uh, mountain breezes and the interaction and the influence of these mountain breezes on the turbulent characteristics. So for that, we uh, see how during some of the nights we have a stronger winds and this creates a neutrally to unstable uh, boundary layer and then the interchanges of uh, heat, momentum, matter like humidity or CO2, carbon dioxide or water vapor enhances during these nights. While on the other hand when we have uh, slower winds, for example when we have more humidity on soil, then normally we have a uh, very, very calm winds. And then the stability is very strong and the turbulent interchange is inhibited. So depending of which kind of uh, turbulent transfer we have, this determines the interchange of another um, transfer uh, properties, as I, I have said uh, before. It is especially interesting the transfer of CO2 because the advection of these winds generate a lot of uh, transfer in this way. So uh, we have uh, done recently uh, a, a PhD uh, where one of the places we have studied is this, this place, the, the area uh, forest. And some of the main conclusions that we have got is related that we have a very repetitive mechanism, especially when we have what it is normally called uh, good weather. So we have weak synoptic uh, situation where there are a uh, low, strong uh, pressure gradient, for example, we have anticyclonic uh, conditions. And in that cases, we have this very uh, repetitive cycle from winds from northwest during the night to southeast during the days. Um, this uh, is the very local processes, but there are uh, another larger scale processes related, for example, with uh, air pollution, with the cycle of air pollution in the city of Madrid. This place is just 50 kilometers far from the, the city center. And then these mesoscale winds, 
can inter uh, interchange properties with the main pollutants at the, at the city. Also, they are related with the winds at the airport, at the Barajas International Airport, and also something related with the fox developed at the airport. So not only we study local processes, we can also apply this knowledge to another larger scale processes. We have a lot of applications. And this is mainly the things that I, I would like to, to share with you. My research in La Herrería Forest is the study of soil respiration. Soil respiration is an ecosystem process that releases carbon dioxide from soil. Research on soil respiration is important because it's one of the understood subjects in ecosystem ecology and partly because it represents the second larger flux of carbon cycling between the atmosphere and terrestrial ecosystems. As one key process of ecosystem, soil respiration is related to ecosystem productivity, soil fertility, and regional and global carbon cycles. Soil respiration plays a critical role in the regulation of carbon cycling on regional and global scales. At the global scale, soil respiration releases carbon at a rate that is more than one order of magnitude larger than the anthropogenic emission. The soil pool from which soil respiration releases carbon is about four times the atmospheric pool. Thus, a small change in soil respiration can seriously alter the balance of atmosphere CO2 concentration. Since the global carbon cycle regulates climate change, soil respiration also becomes relevant to climate change, carbon trading and environmental policy. Since climate change is one of the main challenges facing humanity, quantification of soil respiration is relevant to farmers, foresters and governments. Can respiratory carbon emissions and or photosynthetic carbon uptake be manipulated to maximize carbon storage? Can the managed carbon sinks that long enough to mitigate greenhouse gas emissions in the future? How will soil respiration respond to natural and anthropogenic perturbations? To answer these questions, soil respiration has to be carefully studied. We have to understand the processes involved in soil respiration, examine how these processes respond to environmental change and account for their spatial and temporal variability. In order to do so, we have to make accurate measurements of soil respiration. And I don't know if you remember the instrumentation, the soil and subsoil instrumentation I, show, I showed you in the excursion uh, at Terreria. Well, so here is the result. We have here the time series, the temperature series, from zero meters, ground surface, to depth, until 20 meters, the second borho I showed you on that video. And basically what we have is a deterministic cycle of an annual wave. We, ha we have here the passing of the seasons, and we can see here maximums in summer and minimums in winter. And then this noise, it seems noise, but it's not, is associated to the diurnal cycle. Let's, let's say the temperature that changes between night and day. And as you can see, the signal attenuates with depth. The diurnal cycle is lost like 50 centimeters depth or so. And the, and the annual cycle reaches like a depth of 20, 20 no, 10 meters, uh, 15 meters. Well, and this happens because underneath our feet, the heat is transferred by conduction. That is that the medium transfers the heat by conduction and takes the signal of the surface and it goes down, down, down until it's lost because it's attenuated. Another thing that happens, apart from the attenuation, is that the, the conduction takes a time to produce, to take place. So the time series delay uh, one respect, the, respect to the others. That means that from ground surface temperature to uh, temperature at five meters, for example, we have a delay of 90, 80 days. So the maximums and minimums are like 
the, as you can see, are not in phase, are phase shifted. This information is very useful to study the diffusivity, the thermal diffusivity, into the round. That means that we are trying to study the speed. The speed well, is a parameter that controls the speed and the amount of heat that goes down into the soil from the signal that we have here. And now, it, now in my research line, what we are trying to do is to measure that quantity to quantify it uh, at the different sites that we have in Goodnet, here in Herrería and it, uh, in stations that are located, let's say, in an upper location, at summits or whatever. And after doing that, uh, we will see what, what happens. If uh, diffusivity depends on materials, it seems that it depends strongly on materials, or it depends on another uh, variables that we are not now we don't now understand uh, how they work. And that's basically oh, thank you for your attention. So my aim is to explain to you uh, briefly that within GOMNET, as Felix has already uh, mentioned, we have different stations. At every station we were able to obtain a soil profile and also uh, uh, create the boreholes. Uh, this has enabled us to be able to explain much more, not just what's around the station but what's also in the subsurface of, of that area. And uh, as was mentioned already, we're here in the, at the foothills of the Guada, uh, Sierra de Guadarrama and this has made it possible that through the stations we have a whole sequence of different soils. We can talk about the climate sequence, we can talk about the topographic sequence, we can talk about a lithology sequence and we can also talk about a biogeographical sequence. So all these sequences enable us to actually study uh, along a, a profile from 925 meters up to over 2000 meters uh, different types of soils and uh, the conditions they are in. Uh, this is especially important when we're looking at uh, uh, climate uh, changes and trying to explain what is happening nowadays. So these soils, they will vary according to their location, their exposition and the different um, conditions there uh, in their immediate surrounding. Um, for example, at the highest altitude we'll have a soil which is uh, poorly developed in a mountainous area and uh, will not be uh, have a lot of different uh, soil horizons. We're talking here about soil horizons because we identify the, the soils according to these uh, different horizons. We can talk about a, an A horizon, a B horizon, a C horizon. Uh, they're in different phases of development and evolution and that will mean that the uh, uppermost uh, soil horizon, the A horizon, will normally contain more organic material. This organic material is especially important for all the processes which are more biological, uh, with the microbiology, and uh, the real development of the surface of the soil. When we get to the lower uh, horizons, we're talking about the B or C. In the high mountainous area, we're talking mainly about uh, C, C horizons. That's really the horizon most related with the parent material. Uh, I was talking about liter sequence. The liter sequence will uh, vary from where we're standing, which is more uh, a granitic type uh, of rock, to uh, metamorphic uh, rock, which is gneiss, known as gneiss. And these differences in rock composition will also be important when the soil initially develops. Um, regarding 
the organic material content in the different soils along the topography it will be important to distinguish because mountainous soils or mountain soils can have a lot of uh, organic material but it's not well mineralized. Here our soil profile uh, starts with a A horizon with little organic material and then immediately goes over to different uh, C horizons. These C horizons are successions of deposits of material when maybe there was more material eroded in a different climate setting and uh, other times when there was less material deposited. What we can see is different size fragments in the subsoil in the different horizons. That's how we distinguish the different horizons. Uh, furthermore, we have to say that in this area the bedrock will start around 2 meters. Uh, from 2 meters onwards where we actually have granite and in this type of granite uh, in the upper part we will have uh, more weathered granite and as we go further into depth we'll, we'll find the granite which is well uh, conserved. In this case I've brought a sample here and we can see this is a sample taken at 5 meters and it's a granite which is weathered but has a, a rough typical consistency, granular with a lot of quartz, feldspar and uh, also mica etc. So the composition of this uh, granite will go right down to uh, the 20 meters which uh, has been mentioned before in the bore, bore holes. But if we look in our surrounding we will also encounter uh, bedrock which comes to, to the surface. So I think we have a great chance in, in this group and in this project to actually be able to study soils with a huge uh, difference between one station and the other and this will also help us to relate all things related uh, with climate to the actual um, setting of, of uh, the project objectives uh, which we're aiming to do. Thank you.